In this episode, we're going to continue looking at the new features in Darktable 4.8. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 142 of Understanding Darktable. In the last episode, we looked at the three new modules which were introduced in Darktable 4.8. But there was one more feature in the list of big ones, and that was the addition of this button down here in the bottom of the central part of the UI in the darkroom view. And it's a toggle high quality processing button. And if we have a look at the release notes, they say, implemented a toggle switch for the darkroom mode, forcing the pixel pipe processing to use the whole image data instead of just the area displayed. This allows the user to inspect process data without errors introduced via internal scaling and equals what we get by exporting in high quality resampling mode. So basically what that's saying is that there can be times when you are zoomed in on your image, depending on you know what modules you've got active within that particular pixel pipe, there might be artifacts generated in the preview that you are seeing, which will not be evident when you do a high quality export. And so what this button is doing is allowing you to see a high quality rendered preview of the zoomed in part of the image that you're looking at. So you are getting an idea of what the image will look like when it's actually exported with high quality resampling. And the reason that that's not active all of the time is because of the performance hit that your machine would take if it was active. So that's it for the big ones. Now we move on to the performance enhancements. Rewrote the clustering code in map view for dramatically faster performance on large collections. Mapping should now be usable with more than 1 million geotagged images selected. Wow. Okay. Look, I would love to be able to show you that, but I've obviously stuffed something up when I've compiled this version of Darktable, because if you look here, all I've got is slideshow. I don't have maps and I don't have the print view. So I don't know what's going on there. It's one of those things I'm aware of, and I just need to allocate the time to recompile the software and see if it improves. Anyway, we'll come back to that. So now we are onto that section of the list called other changes. Let's work our way through it one step at a time. Now, at the end of the last episode, I hinted that, in my opinion, one of the best new features in Darktable 4.8 was not actually given the prominence that I felt it deserved in the release notes. And you know what? It's in this section, and it's not even at the top of this section. I'll tell you when we get there changed the sort order of tags to a natural and case insensitive order. So if you look at my tags here, you'll see that the majority of them are capitalized, but I've got some that are not capitalized. Previously, I think everything that was capitalized was one A to Z list, and then everything that was not capitalized was a lowercase A to Z list after the capital Z stuff, where now, they're all just in alphabetical order, irrespective of case, which I think is probably a far more sensible approach. Next up, added Apple Keychain password storage backend for Mac OS devices. Okay, whatever. Uh, I'm assuming if you're a Mac user, you know what that means, and it's obviously a good thing for you. Collect module sorting has been integrated into the module's header instead of a preference. All collections can now be sorted easily by a single click on the sort button. So now under our collections module, we've got this icon here, and that will simply toggle the order in which whatever criteria you are searching on, obviously the default is film roll. But if I was to go by tag, then I can reverse the order of the way the tags are displayed. Or if I was to go by capture date, uh, I could change the order in which they are displayed from oldest to newest to newest to oldest, etc. 
Next up, removed unrestricted mode from Darktable preferences resources for safety. This setting has been proved to be unsafe in many cases. It can still be enabled via the resource file if needed. I have no idea what unrestricted mode was, so I don't think I'm going to miss it. <laughs> Next up. All right. This is the one. This is killer. Added buttons next to the snapshots to allow restoring it as the new history. If you are a Lightroom user, you know, I mean, we'll, we'll forgive you because you're here now. So that's a good thing. You've had this feature for years where you could always go back to the development stack at the point at which you took your snapshot. And up until now, that's not the way Darktable worked. So if we were to go back to our image of Tammy on the beach here, I've developed this to this point. And let's suppose I like this, but maybe I'm thinking, hmm, maybe I want a high contrast black and white, but maybe I'm also liking the idea of the color version. So I want to explore both avenues. So. Let's suppose I decide, okay, I'm going to do the high contrast black and white look. So I'm going to come into my color balance RGB. I'm going to choose my monochrome preset. That gives me that as a starting point. I could use the contrast control that's in the color balance RGB module. I'm now thinking maybe that's a bit too bright. So I'm just going to pull it back a bit and maybe I like that. And then I think, yeah, but maybe I just want to explore that color process a little bit further. So I take a snapshot at this point in time. I now go to my history stack, jump back to this point in time. And now I think to myself, yeah, maybe I want to, you know, push the saturation on this a little bit. And maybe I want to push the chroma just a smidge and give the vibrance a bit of a hit. So I'm really making this quite, you know, intense. But then I'm thinking, well, I don't want to do that to the background. I really only want to do it to uh, the area where Tammy is the center of the shot. So I'm just going to draw a bit of a loose mask around her like that. Shrink that down, but really broaden the feather. So we've got that more dynamic color on Tammy, but we're not applying that to the rest of the image. And then at this point, I think to myself, yeah, maybe, maybe this is not where I wants to go. Maybe I really did prefer the high contrast black and white. So now I can go back to my high contrast black and white look. And I think to myself, yeah, that's really the way I wanted this to go. So now I can click on this button here and that will make this, the history state. That is really cool. I'm loving that. And I think a lot of people are going to get some good mileage out of that because it means you can explore those two avenues without having to go to, you know, the duplicate manager and create another version and, you know, create another XMP file on your file system. I mean, okay, they're, they're tiny files, so it's really not that big an impediment to do that. But this is just a an easier way to explore two different processing paths and then commit to one and not have to worry about, you know, cleaning up the detritus from the, you know, the other failed effort, if you like. So I think that's a, a great new feature. I'm really happy to see that. All right, I'm going to leave it here for this episode. In the next episode, we will continue looking through the remainder of the list of other changes. But before we go, there's a couple of things that I would like to talk about just briefly. At the end of episode 141, I made some comments about the absence of written documentation for the new version of Darktable on the day that that new version ships and how this has been an ongoing problem in the past and it's still a problem today. And I have been inundated with comments from people over the last week uh, via Patreon, via email, via 
comments on Facebook. And there's been quite a chorus of voices who were all singing the same song. And that was, yeah, but Bruce, coders aren't necessarily the best people to be writing the documentation. Sometimes they're real propeller heads. And, and I mean that with the utmost respect. I, I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. Uh, and they think in a very technical way and they speak in a very technical way. And sometimes they struggle to dumb it down for the masses, you know. Uh, so quite often they need to work with someone whose specialty it is to reinterpret their technical jargon and turn it into something that us, the average user, can understand. So I get it. I've heard you. Uh, I totally understand that. Uh, and it wasn't a point of view that I had considered, you know. Um, so I'll just get back in my box. You may have looked at episodes 139 and 140 and thought, well, these don't quite look like Bruce's normal videos. Well, well spotted. No, I farmed out the video editing to a couple of different video editors on Fiverr. And what I came to realize was, okay, no, the look wasn't exactly the way I produce my own videos. But th that could be sorted out with enough time working with one video editor, you would come to understand what, you know, each other wanted, or, or certainly the video editor would come to understand what the client wanted, and that'd be me. Uh, but it's more of a case of, I realized that I just don't earn enough money from YouTube and Patreon just yet to justify spending the money for someone else to edit my videos. Basically, it would take an entire month's worth of my earnings to produce two videos if I paid somebody else. And I'd really like to be turning out more videos than that. So, and I know I haven't been, but it's a goal anyway. So for the moment, I'm going to go back to editing my own videos. The last thing was a year or two into my YouTube journey, I toyed very briefly with the idea of scripting my videos and using a homemade teleprompter. And it didn't quite work for me. And I went back to just free flowing train of thought type videos. The problem with doing that is I end up with hours of outtakes and I've got to sift through all that stuff. And it makes the editing process rather tedious. So I'm going back to the idea of scripting my videos. And I've got a script here. And what I want to do is try and incorporate the script without actually looking at it, because I don't want to be sitting here reading like that, because then I'm not looking at you, and that's going to feel very impersonal. So I don't want to do that. Maybe I need to buy a proper teleprompter. I don't know. But I'm hoping that this will make the editing a little smoother for me, and that might just help me to get a bit more content out the door. Because what I've realized is that I've written three scripts for this episode, the next episode, and the episode, well, sorry, the third one is a Patreon-only episode. But my point is, I've written three scripts this week. So if I can make the recording a little more straightforward, then hopefully the editing will be easier. So that's the plan. All right, guys, I will leave it there. Questions, comments, feedback, sing out down below, and I'll catch you in the next one.